Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chad Moses. I am To Write Love in Our Arms Director of Outreach, and we are thrilled to have you here for our first ever roundtable discussion for World Suicide Prevention Day. Uh, we have an incredible panel lined up today where we're going to be talking about stigma. Uh, in other words, why we need your voice. Through, so through this uh, conversation today, we're going to be talking about things like what keeps us from speaking up and you know maybe what keeps us from speaking up or if we've lost someone, if we've personally thought about suicide or maybe if we've survived an attempt. Uh, the bottom line is that our lived experiences are important. So we're gonna be digging into some of those themes. And before I welcome on our panelists, I do have a few announcements for you. Um, so again, today is the first of three different roundtable discussions that we're gonna be doing throughout uh, this, this time period ramping up to World Suicide Prevention Day. Uh, so we're gonna be having conversations weekly at this time uh, on this platform. Uh, but if you miss it here, then we are gonna be uploading it to YouTube afterwards. Um, not only on Thursdays are we doing round tables, but also on Tuesdays, we're hosting Instagram Live conversations. So we just had uh, a great one a couple of days ago uh, where Jamie was talking to our friend Aaron Moore and Ashlyn Harris of the US National Women's Soccer Team. Uh, so definitely check that out on our YouTube channel or IGTV if you missed that. Um, because we're doing so much in the digital space, uh, definitely keep an eye on our social media for the times that we're gonna be going live as well as a sneak preview of who is gonna be our guests. And one more way to stay in touch with us is through our community text line. So if you uh, send a text to the number 321, two zero four zero five seven eight uh, and we'll pin that somewhere I'm, I'm sure that's three two one two zero four zero five seven eight that's a great way to keep a pulse on uh, on all of the campaign activities that we're doing throughout world suicide prevention day and the worth living for campaign uh, you can see that I'm wearing a campaign shirt and you can too in fact if you order one, uh, through the web store between now and midnight Eastern. And at checkout, use the code worth it. That's all one word, W-O-R-T-H-I-T. You're gonna receive a free WSPD keychain and a pin along with your pack. So again, that code is worth it, all one word. Uh, and just plug that in at checkout when you buy a pack and you get some gifts. Um, so throughout this time period, we have set the goal to raise a quarter of a million dollars for treatment and recovery. That's $250,000. And uh, with that, we're planning on funding 3,500 counseling and therapy sessions and helping to sponsor over 45,000 searches through our Find Help tool, which helps connect people to free and reduced cost mental health care services specific to your area. Uh, so right now we are creeping up on $20,000. It's a great start, uh, but it's never too early to, to sign up to help uh, drive those funds and, and help connect people to our campaign and help us reach that goal. Uh, if you forgot any of what I just said, we have that uh, laid out very graphically, prettily at worthlivingfor.com. Again, that's worthlivingfor.com. Uh, lastly, we have a really cool opportunity with a digital music festival going on this weekend. So on Saturday and Sunday, uh, it is Alone Together Music Festival. You can learn all about that at alonetogetherfest.com. You can find the info and the set times, but uh, it's basically running from noon until 11-ish Pacific time all day on Saturday and Sunday some incredible headlining acts from the EDM world. Uh, it's gonna be a blast. And the entire festival is focused around conversations surrounding mental health. Uh, so in fact, it's free to watch. You can watch that on uh, Proximity's YouTube channel or on Twitch, uh, Alone Together Fest has their own Twitch channel as well. Uh, you can watch for free, but they are gonna be fundraising throughout the weekend. Uh, my apologies if you hear any thunder. There's one heck of a storm happening right now in Florida. Um, but proceeds uh, through fundraising are going to go help support Tuloha, Active Minds, and the Black Mental Health Alliance. So definitely uh, check that out this weekend if you're looking for a fix to your music cravings. 
Uh, lastly, we do hope to take a few questions today from you, the audience. So if something that we say, uh, you know, sparks something in your mind that you, you want some, uh, a deeper dive into any particular comment, then uh, just drop a message in the comment section and our team will be sure to relay those on to us if we have time. Um, and if not, please know that anytime you can ask us a question through uh, social media or through info at uh, If you have questions, we are, are here to uh, be a safe place for those questions and hopefully point you in a direction where you can find uh, some consistent uh, and hopefully local answers to, to that help. Um, that is all of the announcements. Uh, took me a little bit longer than I wanted, but we still have uh, a little over 50 minutes to have incredible conversations. So uh, we are gonna be bringing on our panel. So today with us, we have Sarah Johnson. She is the CEO of Vision 22. Uh, we have my friend, Steve Wynn. He's a writer, illustrator, animator, and director. If you listen to the Twiloha podcast, he is our current voice uh, for this year or this week's podcast. Uh, we have our friend Joel Leon. He's been uh, chiming in uh, throughout this, this pandemic season, and it's just such an honor to have him back with us. And then we have our new friend Jessica from uh, the Jed Foundation. So thank you guys so much for taking the time to to be with us today. Um, I just totally blew through your names and just teach people with what you do. So uh, let's start there. Let's um, let's start with Steve and then just kind of go around and just, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, uh, your name, where you're from, if you represent an organization, maybe give us an idea of what you do there um, and anything else you care to add. But uh, Steve, I'll kick it to you. No, Chad, you did a great job kind of introducing all of us, but just to just relay it back, uh, yeah, I'm an artist animator based in Los Angeles. Uh, I specialize in doing campaign work to bring awareness to various causes like mental health, uh, environmental pollution, education. Uh, so yeah, I'm just glad to be here to contribute to the conversation. Awesome, and on to Jessica. Hey Chad. Um, hi everyone. My name is Jessica Orenstein. I'm a black woman from the Midwest, specifically from a small town in Illinois right outside of St. Louis. And typically I start off with that because those are like the core identify the identities that, you know, play so much into who I am. And I'm here today on behalf of the Jed Foundation. Uh, Jed is located in New York City and is a nonprofit that protects the emotional health and prevents suicide for our nation's teens and young adults. At Jed, I'm the senior manager of high school programming. I have a background in public health, specifically in behavioral science and health education. I'm a public health advocate, a youth advocate, and a laugh expert. My laugh is awesome. <laughs> you won't hear it today, but that's okay. <laughs> Something to look forward to, though. I'll, I'll keep an ear out. Joel, you, would you mind uh, reintroducing yourself to the Twiloha audience? I do not mind. Um, Joel Leon. Born and bred Bronx, New York, uh, BX in the building. Um, uh, I am a storyteller, I'm a poet, I'm a father. Um, I tell stories for black people, write and tell stories for black people generally what my, uh, my, my MO is. Um, my, and my creative practice is really centered around decolonizing and dismantling uh, oppressive systems um, through the use of my art. So excited to be here. Excited to be here with a, a, a very dope um, exception to give the people, people who are doing the work um, on the field and in their spirits. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Joel. And Sarah. Oh, I think you may be muted, Sarah. That's helpful. I'm Sarah Johnson. Um, I'm the CEO of Mission 22. Uh, we are based out of Central Oregon, but we serve nationwide. Um, and we really focus on mental health for veterans. Uh, we do large scale memorials as well and serving their families, uh, their children and their communities as well. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, looks like Joel um, just, uh, I don't know, maybe Uber Eats came, came to visit him. Uh, he'll, he'll be back shortly, I'm sure. Um, but while we're waiting for Joelle to return, uh, again, this conversation that we're having today is about stigma. And uh, welcome back, buddy. We missed you. I hate the internet. This is Y'all <laughs> <laughs> just switched places there at the bottom. So now I, I have to 
be wary of, of where everyone is. It's like hide and seek, except you're right in front of me. So, ah, <laughs> so uh, again, today's conversation is about stigma. Uh, we opened today with some announcements. We're talking about our fundraising that we're doing for the Worth Living For campaign. And I think if we're going to be honest, you know, we, we all realize that suicide is not an issue that will be solved just by throwing money at it. Um, that there are uh, influences that are bigger than finances when it comes to treating and caring for people struggling with suicide. And, um, you know, for us uh, as an organization, and, and I'm sure for, for Sarah and for Jess as well, uh, one of our biggest organizational battles is, is really with this idea of stigma, with the things that keep us silent. Uh, stigma can be a loaded term, or it could be one of those words that we just heard forever and we've never been able to really place uh, a definition to it. Uh, so I'm going to turn it to, to y'all to see if we can work on finding a, a working definition for stigma. So uh, let's start um, with Joelle, and then we can work our way around for whoever wants to answer. But how would you define stigma? Um, and maybe in that definition, you could use some personal experience. How have you firsthand experience stigma? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think for me, stigma ties back to um, a leaning into projections and biases towards um, um, uh, a segmented group based on the experiences um, and, and attributing those projections and biases as a way to um, hinder how others experience things. Like I, I, I think about my own, my own journey, um, through understanding uh, mental health disorders and, um, and, and, and illnesses and, and how self-care plays a role in that. And, you know, I, I've had my own bouts with suicide ideations um, and, and, and attempts. And, and so for me, when I think about the conversations that were hard to have in the black community, because it felt like, and specifically really when I talk about, talk about it through the lens of a black man and, and going to black men to, to have the conversation, which wasn't happening. I, I wasn't having the conversation um, with, with men. I mean, to be frank and to be honest, and, and it's something I say a lot, um, black women have probably been the biggest um, support for, for me um, as far as creating a platform for me to sift through trauma. But I also think it, it's worked in parallel because the, that community is also giving me that support. And for me, it's allowed me the opportunity to talk more about the stigmas um, and, and understanding where they come from. You know, it, it's, we, we throw the words crazy around a lot, you know, like that person's just crazy or, you know, like like we attribute behaviors to something that kind of goes back to the far recesses of our mind as opposed to looking at the, the, the symptomatic conditions of our environments that create that. Um, and so for me, a lot of the work, and I think a lot of the work that a lot of us really are doing right here on this on this panel, on this platform, is trying to dismantle those stigmas so that we can have broader conversations about mental health. Yeah, man. So you, you started saying by it's a, uh... What, what were your words when uh, projections become kind of normalized or normative, I, I guess? Yeah, that is, yeah, you, that is the very straightforward answer that I, I could have went with, but I did not. But yeah, it's the normalization of those things that it becomes a truth. Yeah. And you wind up not dissecting and, and having evolved conversations surrounding what actually exists as opposed to the stigmas behind those things. I dig that. Uh, Panel, any, any other thoughts or what does stigma mean to you when, when you see stigma, um, you know, kind of dropped in conversation? What does that signify to, to you guys? I think stigma is really almost a reduction where, you know, mental mm. illness is reduced to something that's caught like a virus rather than a manifestation of underlying, you know, causes and experiences. Um, so I think that reduction really minimizes what's going on and puts it in this little neat box that, that society can be okay with, um, rather than opening it up to what is actually going on for each individual person. So, you know, there's this big box of mental illness, but, you know, that's a vast amount of underlying causes and experiences that brought it to that point. That's great. So we got projection, we got a sense of reduction Jess, what, what comes to mind for you? Um, I was thinking that it is definitely around the negative perceived belief and perceived attitudes towards, you know, people uh, or a person or even something. So something being mental health. 
Um, but definitely we operate off of perceived beliefs and attitudes when, we, when I think of stigma. Um, I also think, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a lot of our stigmas come from generational traumas and misunderstandings. Um, and that's hard to break down because <laughs> for, for a variety of different reasons, but um, off the top, that's what I'm, I'm thinking of when I think of stigma and how it differs depending obviously on, on who you are, your background, how you were raised, where you were raised, um, but definitely those perceived beliefs and attitudes and the generational traumas and misunderstandings that often, the misunderstandings are sometimes unfounded. They're, they're founded on experiences obviously, but not necessarily on, well, that can be complicated too, because those are people's lived experiences, those are facts, those are, those are what they went through. Those are the experiences they went through, but those are kind of the thoughts around it. Yeah. Steve, how, how about you? What, what thoughts kind of surround this idea of taking to you? Yeah, uh, you guys can agree with me or not or disagree, but I kind of liken stigma to prejudice in a way. Um, they're both kind of really complex concepts that encompass like individual experience and perspectives. But you know, prejudice focuses on macro, so you know, group level characteristics like race, whereas stigma focuses on the micro, so like individual level, such as ailments, illnesses, all that stuff. But I feel like the common link between those two are they both stem from misinformation. And maybe because it's our society that lacks a fundamental understanding to what those underlying issues are, or if it's easier to just like fully dismiss what we don't fully comprehend. Um, I don't believe stigma is like a unique narrative to illness, like to any illness in the history of mankind. You know, just look at like how the AIDS epidemic was dealt with in the 80s and now like present day dealing with COVID-19, right? We're just seeing a lot of misinformation and hatred out there. Um, and just like every major issue we face in the world, uh, stigma just derives from misinformation, prejudice, discrimination, and you know, lack of access to care. So eventually, if we're able to treat and bring awareness to those issues, then hopefully we can eliminate the prejudice and stigma that follows. Yeah, man. So in, in just one quick uh, around the horn here, we got, we got prejudice, we hit perceptions driving the narrative, we hit projections driving the narrative. And then uh, Sarah, remind me, oh, a reduction, um, you know, a, a minimizing. And, you know, I feel like with all of these, to me, it's, if I were to weave these together, uh, it sounds like, you know, stigma is, is when silence becomes the loudest voice in a conversation for any number of reasons. Maybe it's too difficult to talk about. It. Maybe I don't feel like I have the words to talk about it. Um, Jess, I'm going to kick this to you, knowing that you're someone that works with, uh, with high school um, activism. And, you know, I can't help but, but see, you know, as diverse of a panel as this is, we're all people that would identify as adults, right? Like we've had a lot of time to work out our personal struggles with stigma, with mental illness, with, uh, or with mental health. Um, however, we see so often that younger people haven't had either the, the lived experience or haven't had a, the breadth of perspectives from wise people to speak in their lives, to let them know that it's, it's okay to not be okay, that what you're feeling is not out of the ordinary. So just to kick this to you, maybe for, for some of our younger audience members out here or people that love uh, or, and care for younger members of our society, what are some ways that we can help communicate what stigma is and how we can break it down with, with younger folk? I think that's really complicated. <laughs> um, but I, think it, I think it really just starts with having, well, I mean, what well, many people in, in workplace call it courageous conversations or just keeping a real conversations or I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel, but, you know, in the best way that I can conversations. I mean, Joel, when you first introduced yourself, you said I'm a storyteller. Stories being a storyteller, sharing your story is what opens the conversation mm -hmm. to, to breaking down anything, whether it's stigma or, or uh, discrimination or racial injustice, anything. And so I think for young adults, teens and young adults, I think the first way to do this 
is to not so much focus on let me break down this huge thing that we're all trying to figure out a way to break down in the first place, but just start having those courageous conversations and, and being comfortable in being uncomfortable, which which brings on a certain level of confidence and self-efficacy that even as adults, we don't always have the most of, depending on what we're what what we're talking about and what we're going through and the timing of our lives. And but for young people, I think it's really having those conversations, um, having I talk about introspection a lot, talking to yourself first, and then having those those conversations and sometimes declarations with people around you. So. I think when we, we, we challenge ourselves as focusing on such a big thing, it, it takes away those smaller tasks that can be accomplished before we get to that big thing. So that's that's kind of where I'm what I'm thinking right now in terms of where students or teens and young adults can start. I love that because you, you were also hinting at it being a two way street conversationally that uh, you said, you know, even though we're adults, even though we've been around for longer, it doesn't mean that we necessarily have all the the answers or that we're, you know, de facto more right than, than a younger person on, on any issue. Mm-hmm. So, right. so young folks, uh, you role in this conversation too, and it's not just to listen, but, but you get to share your story as well and be a part of breaking down some of the unrecognized stigmas that, that I still deal with. Even mm-hmm. after you know, 12 years of working in this field, I'm still learning every day. Um, Same. Sarah, where I guess same question, but to the the military uh, experience, what what have you found to be kind of uh, the most silencing factors in in people seeking mental health care uh, within the military context? Absolutely. So I think a big issue for them, especially when you're looking at active duty, is the fear for them of if I do say something, if I do, you know, it's the military is very um, uh, immediate base is like, okay, you have a problem, you go talk to a counselor. If it's bad enough, you're going to lose your clearance, you're going to lose your job, um, you may be forced to retire, um, you may be just completely kicked out. So I think for a lot of them, it's that fear of losing their position of where they're at right now. Um, and then once they get out, the stigma of, you know, I'm too weak, I can't do this by myself. But what Jessica said, you know, community, it's community is so important. And storytelling as a way of healing has been used since the dawn of history. Like as far as recorded history goes, we have stories that have been told. Um, and it's a back and forth of a sharing of the burden, right? So like mm-hmm. that story may be too heavy for them to carry on their own, but by telling their community and their support network, you know, it's so much lighter if it's shared and it's carried together. So I, I just wanted to touch on what she said because I think that is so, so important um, for veterans as well is to be able to tell their story um, and to be able to get the help that they need without fear of losing their job. Joelle, as someone who is a self-described, uh, and I would also describe you as a storyteller, uh, what, what role um, have you personally been in storytelling and taking you know, bold stances narratively uh, to, to break down stigma? Well, you know, I, I think about, it, it's something I bring up often, um, Lauren Hill in her Unplugged CD, the second CD, she talks about exposing her belly button. And it's like, oh, I have a belly button. Everyone gets to say I have a belly button too. And it, for me, it, it became, it, it got to a point, like I'm 37 now. I, I got to the point where I realized I was garnering more strength by being vulnerable. And I was also seeing the, the, the I mean, I initially started really telling my stories of like the, the, the sexual trauma I, I suffered as a child and, and things of that sort, because I was having a child. And for me, it was important to ensure the safety of my child by confronting my demons so that I didn't pass them on to her. And so to do that like kind of cathartic experience of writing, right, of performing, um, I, I started to see people receive it. And I started seeing black men receive it, white men, black women, trans, whomever. Like it was me sharing stories that were essentially part of the human experience. And I realized that, that the more that I was sharing the story, the more likely that others would also do the same, which I think directly ties back to what Jessica and Sarah are talking about. Um, and then for me, what I've also what, what I'm also thinking about too is the reception. And I think as Jessica was, was talking before, right? It's it is this kind of back and forth, this reciprocity that happens when we're sharing the story. Because I benefit just as much from people receiving it. Um, and I think for us, it is 
dutifully important to ensure that we are creating safe spaces for everyone to share their story. Because if people don't feel like they can share their story, then they won't. Um, and so I think it's up to us and like me, understanding my privilege, recognizing like I am, yes, a cis hetero black man. So like, what are my privileges in this world? And how do I create more space so that folks who maybe are, like my father used to serve in the military. My father was a, is a former Vietnam veteran. who also suffers from paranoid schizophrenia, right? And so having to recognize that my father was never really given the tools, he wasn't given the access. He also wasn't given the space to share his stories upon returning home and even now. And so it's important for us to do that as a community. Yeah. You, you brought up, um, you know, access right there, uh, access to, to resources, access to safe places to, to share. And I think that's also kind of related to access to words, access to, to mm -hmm. have the right language to, to effectively sum up what you're feeling. Um, so Steve, to kick this to you as someone that, that works with, uh, with written word, works with scripts, and, and also works a lot with art, uh, how have you seen, um, you know, specifically on the art side of things, uh, visual takes on on stigma and mental health help break down these these barriers to people finding help. So just recently, um, I don't know if you guys watched the Joker movie recently with Joaquin Phoenix. Um, if you haven't, it's cool. But um, if you've watched it, um, for me, it made me think about kind of like really hard about how society doesn't value mentally ill people, and more often than not, they, how they're left to fend for themselves. Um, it was just a really problematic idea and issue um, that everyone had to face watching that movie. You know, everyone just wanted to watch a superhero movie or a villain movie, but it it tied in a lot of you know harsh truths to the matter. Um, you know, and I had my own doubts dealing with things, and watching that just kind of reaffirmed everything that I was going through. And you know, people have it way more extreme, obviously. In that case, that was like the ultimate extreme, right? And I feel like these platforms are so valuable for people to to watch, you know, and kind of absorb what the deeper messages are, right? Um, you know, for me, um, you know, I, I guess like I hope that we can take away the stigma, of mental illness, and just support one another, uh, no matter if one has mental illness or not. Um, uh, it's a very powerful tool, you know, these visuals. Um, and I hope that like, you know, more, more and more content like that is out there that really can convey that personal experience and perspective that others can connect to as well. Yeah. And I, you bring up a good point there that uh, I don't think that the writers or directors or actors of that film or any film would claim to be, you know, the the end point for conversation as it relates to, to mental health. But the hope is that this would inspire conversation. The hope is to uh, explore different perspectives and, and different narratives. And I think that so much of this conversation with stigma, especially with, with mental health, is no one wants to feel isolated, right? No one wants to feel exiled or alone. Um, I have a, a friend, Dan Smith, he performs under the name Listener, and he suggests that I think the only reason we talk about the weather is that I need someone to agree with, that it's, it's raining, right? You, you see that, right? You know, so I bring up something that seems super easy to agree with just so I don't feel so alone. And that's easy when we're talking about weather, but it gets more difficult when you're talking about mental health. Um, frequently people say, man, if, if I talk about this, will anyone understand me? Or uh, Joel, you you brought this up in your introduction. You know, I don't want people to think that I'm I'm crazy. Um, the reality is, for as long as we've been doing this, and as long as Jed has been doing their thing, and Mission Point Two has been doing their thing, and even Joel has been on the planet, I think you would agree that mental health conversations, whenever someone's sharing their story, they're not saying it in a way that saying I'm the only one that's done with this. You know. Um, uh, lift my story up on a pedestal, but the, to feel a sense of connection, say, look, I'm going to put myself out there just in case you have felt that way too. All of that to lead up to this question. What are some myths tied to mental health that you feel people operate under that if only we were to through it, we'd find that we share so much of a common experience already. What have you seen in your kind of respective corners to say, look, the thing that's keeping you silent actually could be a beautiful point of connection.
And that's to anyone who feels like talking. <laughs> I was about to say, like, are we, we gonna do let's do rock paper scissors. Um, I, <laughs> my, my immediate thought goes to I I think of treatment. Um, you know, like I'm I'm very much a, a, a fan of the holistic um, view, right? But but I also also think it's very important to recognize that we are, like we all aren't the same, and so there are some who will benefit from psychotropic medications and what that means, and and being able to have those kind of complex conversations with our communities about maybe like if if a holistic if, if a holistic treatment is, is is working in tandem with psychotropic medications I, I've, I've heard folks kind of disavow medications because it's like they don't work they the the the, the side effects are, like all these other things that, that I think um, are, are important conversations to have but but I think we do ourselves a disservice when like I know, I know folks who are on psychotropics who live a much better life because of, of psychotropic medications. And for some, that's not the course of action. And I mean, and granted, I think this all kind of all goes back to the like the, the the stigma right behind those who use psychotropic medications and what that means. And I think the automatic thought is like you're crazy, you know. And and wanting folks to be able to feel like they can talk openly about a their like any diagnosis or diagnoses that they might have but also in tandem being able to communicate if they are on medications and why that is working for them and not have others devalue that experience for them just because it's not theirs. I love that. Thanks, Joel. I think a, um, a myth that I've heard, I don't think it's as prominent as it once was. Uh, I'm sure that could depend on like the level of community that we're speaking about, but that whole myth that therapy is for white people. I've heard that a lot, um, and and but I think it's totally different today. And from having places like therapy for Black girls, or having even down to the minor hashtags like Black Girl Magic and Black Boy Joy, those are communities coming together to talk about therapy, and that is kind of where we've evolved from that from how much I used to hear that therapy is not for, for black and brown people when I was younger to where, to how I hear it being spoken about today, which is we have these spaces, we hold these spaces and it may not be necessarily in traditional therapeutic ways, but it's very much so in this community, the sense of community. And, and I know that at JED, we, we promote that a lot. We work with public mental health. It's not the traditional mental health therapy that you think of, but we look to empower communities to empower themselves, to find structures, even in this, in, in a structure that you may not think, you may not think of, but I, I, all to go back to, I won't get into a long tangent, but that is a myth that I think is still prominent in some cases, not as prominent for the most case, but is very much being handled in such a beautiful way that you can literally go on Instagram and look at that hashtag and you'll see all this greatness, all this, this beauty and community supporting each other. So, Yeah, Jess, I think you bring up a really power, powerful narrative there um, that you were connecting it to the intersection of, of race. Uh, and I think we could probably draw it out to numerous other intersections of help is for these people, but help is not for me. Um, that I am somehow excluded from this, be it by race or uh, I was an A plus student in high school, so I should have my S together in, in college. So, you know, or uh, I have too much money for help. I have too little money for help. You know, so there, there's so much of this conversation of access and 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 worth. Who deserves it? Who is worthy of of this help? Um, and before we move the conversation forward, to anyone watching this, if you feel like you need help, you are worthy of that help. That we're we're all sitting here today saying that there is nothing that's going to prevent us from helping you connect to a resource that keeps you on the planet for even just one more day. And we can keep adding just one more day do this over and over again. Um, but uh, Jess, if you don't mind me piggybacking on, on your comment, I'd love to, to kick it to Steve. Uh, Steve, you talked a lot about um, 
about friends that you lost uh, to suicide in, in college. What, what role did you see or do you see looking back on how stigma uh, prevented your, your friends from seeking the help that, that they deserve? Wow, I don't know if I'm like really well equipped to answer that for them, but um, yeah, no, it was it was tough, you know. Especially, you know, we're dating back to like ten years ago. The access to the kind of care that was needed wasn't necessarily, you know, accessible or affordable. And I just kept asking myself, like, why isn't this easier to access for you know us, for people who are going through depression or whatever? You know, it doesn't discriminate by any means, right? Uh, yet, you know, so few resources are available. Um, and I just believe mental health should be viewed as health in general, right? It yeah. just deals with a different part of our body that we're just still learning so much about. And, you know, I, I'm grateful that like nonprofits and organizations like yours are what we need to work together against stigma. So I, I, I told you back the conversation we had last week, you know, I came across Jamie's poem, something like that on MySpace back in like 2007 that went viral. and. You know, it, it definitely touched me in a way that I kind of needed to hear someone out that had gone through very similar circumstances. Yeah. Uh, I'm, like I told you before also, like I'm one for finding solutions, not necessarily dwelling on the pain. So it's tough, right? It's a, it's a, I, I'm, not, I'm not like everybody, right? It's just if something's ailing or something, I, I have to look for solutions to, to figure out how to deal with it. But I realize that's not the case for everybody especially you know people like who just neglect it entirely or might not necessarily know how to deal with it in their own way or just they grow up in a family or like community that doesn't necessarily value it so yeah you know um i like to focus on myself you know i, I always ask myself like you know do i deserve uh do i deserve to be better right do i deserve this kind of care or am i just gonna you know, just be miserable about it. And I just realized it came across as a time where I, I just can't do that to myself. So that was really the bottom line. Um, and over time now, now here we are, we're having this conversation that I thought I'd never have, to be honest with you, with a public forum. So, you know, it shows the progress that, you know, so much can be done in a matter of time if you focus on well being, you know, just getting better. Yeah, man. And I'm so, so thankful to, to have your voice in this conversation. It's uh, been three years in coming, but we, we, we got there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Sarah, uh, to, to put it back into to your world, um, yeah. I know that you said that you work both with, with veterans and, uh, and to a growing extent, active duty. Yeah. What, what are some elements of stigma that perhaps um, would be more valuable if veterans were to to reach out to active duty in in their journey with mental health. Where where can you see those walls of stigma break down just through status of actively serving or or retired from service? Well, and it goes even a little bit further than that, kind of what Jessica said of like feeling not worthy. And so, you know, we have veterans reach out all the time that are like, well, I was only deployed once. Uh, so maybe it wasn't as bad as somebody else, you know, I wasn't deployed at all, but they were sexually assaulted. So it's like, they're minimizing their experience, um, which, you know, which you had said earlier, she was about mental health challenges, where what if we change that narrative to mental health experiences, um, to be able to share with people about what's going on and how, you know, where a veteran can get with active duty and talk about how they managed to get through during their transition period of leaving the military. Um, so I think people just learning to be able that their experience is valuable and that there's somebody out there that you don't know who's going to hear your story that just might have needed it that exact moment to save their life. Um, so sharing your story can just be a, that one simple thing that made somebody pick one more day, um, you know, to be able to take the time to get the health they need. So I'm a, I'm a huge believer in storytelling and to be able to value your experience um, because it is valuable and it did happen to you and it affected you, um, which means it's worthy of getting help for. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Uh, so we, we've all talked about the value of storytelling in our lives and 
uh, for us that come from the nonprofit side of things, we know uh, how important it is to, you know, find a catchphrase, find a statement, find uh, something marketable to, to get the word out there. For Joel and for Steve, finding something that can grab people's attentions to keep the conversation moving forward. I think we can all agree that language is important. And we touched on a little bit earlier of sometimes we feel like we, we lack the proper language. Maybe we feel like we lack the, uh, the proper education to be an authoritative voice for whatever that, that means in, in caring for people around us. Uh, but what are some words and phrases that we should start subbing in uh, for, for some maybe less helpful phrases? We said earlier, uh, it really doesn't help to say, oh, you're, you're crazy or, oh, you know, they're, they're just acting crazy when, you know, that, that's a word that can easily be weaponized and, and keep people from, from seeking help. Uh, so drawing on your own experiences, what are some helpful phrases or words or ways of speaking about mental illness and mental health? Um, Sarah just offered a great one with challenges versus experiences. Uh, what are some things that we should start inserting in our vocabulary? Uh, let's start with Jess on this one. Um, okay, before I say any phrases, I just want to say like language is so is is really important, obviously, like you said, but it's also really difficult and it's complex and it it takes a lot of work and a lot of energy. Um, and I think it's 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 important to be mindful of how our language can can be hurtful to others at times, but. But at the same time, for people, for some people, changing our language, language that has been so deeply rooted in us for however long can feel really taxing. It can make us feel like we're, we're almost muting ourselves and we are really just changing up some things so that we are supporting others around us that may feel like our language is hurtful. But changing language in general can be challenging. I just want to start, start with that. Um, I, I guess, you know, just I, I actually just did a, a PD session on language, believe it or not. And it's funny because I can't think of anything to come up off the top of my head other than like what you're saying when we say it's crazy or that's so crazy. Even in, in, in basic language, when we're like, oh, man, that's so crazy. And you're like, wait, I work in mental health. Probably shouldn't say that, you know, or even saying uh, low man on the totem pole or grandfathered in or I mean, I can go down a list of. <laughs> of words and phrases um, that are incredibly inappropriate and deeply rooted in um, racism or deeply rooted in just injustices in general. Um, but off the top, I think basic language like it's crazy or coming in here and saying, hey, you guys, I don't know how anyone identifies in this room. I don't know their, their pronouns. And even saying, what are your preferred pronouns? It's not a preference, this is who I am. So instead of saying, what are your preferred pronouns? What are your pronouns? You know, things like that are just some things that come off the top of my head, but I'll leave it at that as for me um, and my experiences. No, that's great. My, my, yeah, experiences, yeah. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point that this isn't, you know, uh, meant to be a conversation of, of policing language. Um, the, the hope is to make sure people that may be on the, the precipice of seeking help feel supported in in the next step towards seeking help. So uh, at no point are we going to, you know, smack your hand or, or give you demerits for using uh, the wrong phrasing. Um, but this is at the heart of it, the hope of connecting more people, not allowing our language to, uh, to be a barrier between community uh, or between health professional or, or community help. Yeah. Oh, can I chime in just like real quick? Uh, if it's cool. <laughs> no, um, yeah, no, it's it's definitely important. I'm aware of the sensitivity, uh, especially you know in the last few years that words do have on the mental psyche. Um, so, you know, when you know when Kanye was going through his presidential run, everyone was like dismissing this crazy and stuff like that, right? And we saw on a very public forum, you know, what these breakdowns look like. And I'm sure you see it a lot on social media where people will just post crazy things and we just dismiss it, right? So 
I find myself doing this more so now, like instead of saying like in my mind, like that person's crazy or whatever, like I just say, you know, I, I hope that person gets the help they need. You know, that's really all it boils down to, right? Instead of just saying mm -hmm. you're crazy and yeah, I just feel like it's just a more, I guess, humbling way to put it. Yeah, it's a posture thing, right, Steve? Like you yeah. went from that person is X to I hope yeah. that their story can mm -hmm. continue. And it, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a beautiful way of including yourself, um, even if it's just a mental exercise in, into, the, into the collective experience. I love that. I think too, and, 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 it, and it kind of ties, goes back to what Steve is talking about and also what Jessica is talking about. When we look at reframing the language, I think it's important for us to unpack language. Like we we generally as a society and as communities use words like, well, that was awesome. And it's like, is it really awesome? Like, like <laughs> is that is that actually awesome? Or um, it, it, and as a parent, you know, um, and the parents to, to, to two little black girls. The, the, the work for me is like, you know, it's not telling Lila she's smart, right? It's why, she, like whatever she's doing and speaking to that thing. And I think it's important and imperative for us. Like when, we're, when we want to use a word like crazy or, you know, going off the rails or like I'm bipolar or this is bipolar, like what are we trying to actually communicate and then communicating that? You know, in in a, in a world of like TTYLs and LOLs, and it's really easy for us to kind of just abbreviate the meaning behind the thing because we're so used to right having to communicate that way because time. And I think the more we can kind of slow down and really think about what we're trying to express to people, the less likely we are to put ourselves in positions where we're misgendering people or where um, inappropriately using language that is not really speaking to or descriptive of the situation, you know? I think in two, we're with Mission 22, something we've been working on the last couple of years. And like Jessica said, it's really difficult to change it's people just, it's a way they've always said it, um, but specifically pertaining to suicide is the word commit. So it's like commit suicide. And it's like, you can commit a crime, uh, you can commit treason, mm -hmm. um, but, the only, there's no crime that the fact that the, they felt that the best way out of their pain was to take their life. Um, and that's where we truly try to change that language mm -hmm. is, you know, they're taking their lives. Um, there's not been a crime. The crime is that we weren't there to support them and that they felt they didn't have the access to mental health care. Um, so that's one from kind of the veteran standpoint that we've been working on changing that language over the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah and Jay, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chad. I would say, yeah. Jed, we we do the same thing. We you know we we try to change that because instead of saying commit, I mean, even the way we frame that, it it sounds like well, let me make a commitment to do something, and then that shit. It's 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 so so many levels to that. But we say you know lost their life to suicide or passed to suicide. Seeing things similar to what you do at Mission Twenty Two. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No. Thank you for that. And. And again, the, the hope is not to, to police conversation. Uh, so much of our language has mm -hmm. been something that's been passed down to us. And it's possible that we just weren't aware uh, that a better way mm -hmm. of, of framing these conversations exists. Uh, and I think that one way that we can continue to find more inclusive ways of, of discussing sensitive topics is uh, maybe challenge is too strong of a word but but dig a little bit deeper. If someone says, oh, that, that was crazy, say, hey, you said this word, what did you mean by that? What, what were you mm -hmm. trying to convey there? And, and then likely you're gonna find a, a better way of, of framing it, uh, or at least have a better discussion than just saying, okay, I guess we all can agree on this word, even though I don't really like it and I don't find it helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing that I've been trying to institute in my personal speech is uh, inserting the word confusing. Um, I, I saw someone stop themselves in real time. I said, man, wasn't that crazy? Wait, I don't, I don't mean crazy. Wasn't that confusing how, how that happened? It's like actually confusing is a way better word there because now I know that I'm not the only one shrugging my shoulders at what just happened. Um, so I, I think this goes back to Sarah's definition of stigma that this 
is a way instead of reducing the conversation, we are now opening it up. We're we're inventing a language uh, around something that's befuddled us for for far too long. Any any closing thoughts on that one? Because we just did get a great question in from uh, from the comment section that I'd love to to delve into. Delving we go. Uh, so we we've, we've talked a lot about how our personal stories have been an asset uh, into the conversations. How we've seen our conversations kind of raise the bar of further conversations. Have you experienced the flip side? Have you? ever been shamed for sharing your story? Um, and yeah, I guess we'll leave, leave it there and let some follow-up questions um, kind of emerge on their own. But the question is, have you ever felt shamed for sharing your story? I think, oh, was that, I don't know who that was. Joel? Nope, nope. The world was not. The world was not the Joel, Joel. Was about to say for. No, Okay. Well, before I say anything, uh, pardon me for saying Joel instead of Joel. Um, Just this one. Yes. Uh, but I don't think I've. Fortunately, I've, I've, I don't think I've been shamed, but I have felt dismissed after mm -hmm. sharing my story. Um, I. Unfortunately, uh, when I was in graduate school, my sister uh, passed away and I was in the middle of my capstone and, and trying to graduate and pass my comprehensive exams. And oddly enough, my uh, my capstone project was on suicide. Um, so it's really difficult. And I, I shared so that story with people but it didn't change the fact that I had to still do that capstone project and I wasn't somehow given an alternate option. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt at that time that my story was heavily dismissed uh, by my graduate school. However, um, I felt redeemed at graduation when I walked across the uh, stage I did pass, thankfully. Um, I felt redeemed when some of my professors that knew about my sister's passing, they just gave me a huge hug and they were like, we knew you could do it. We knew you can get through it. Um, so it went from like being feeling dismissed and struggling to get through everything um, to feeling that huge, just good feeling. I can't think of anything else, but it was a, it was a great feeling. And um, the people who acknowledged uh, me passing were, were some of the ones who, who I think completely unintentionally um, made me feel dismissed. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I, I like I, I like what you're saying, Jessica, because I think, especially the tail end of that for me, because it is very easy for us to get in our own bubbles about how perceptions, right? And like perceiving and um i same similar like i don't necessarily think i've been shamed for it i know i've received racist remarks based on my story which is completely different um but but i think for me it's it's been more about i've, I've been I'm, i've been really fortunate i think i've been really fortunate to, to, to feel and be empowered in the space and I, and I think there've probably been folks who maybe might have wanted to, but I haven't seen it. Um, you know, I, I think for the most part, me leaning into my vulnerability and, and leaning into telling um, the, the, the stories. And I think to Katie's point, just seeking attention. What I will say, and I think that's actually a very important clarifying, a clarifying thing to bring up because I myself have had that thought in my mind and not coming from anyone else but from anyone like what what is the actual goal of this story you know and it's very easy for the story that you're telling to feel like a thing that you're doing because people are retweeting people are liking people are sharing people are commenting you know and it, you can fall into this trap of thinking that it's more about ego as opposed to oh wait this is really for me and, and cathartic for me you know and like that's the reason behind sharing it I could imagine a world where folks would look at that and think um, because either they haven't experienced it or um, 
those who have been potentially have experienced it and looking at your story and seeing it that way, but I haven't from outside of myself seen seen that happen. Yeah, I, I feel like that's certainly one of the the biggest narratives that that deserves challenging is this idea of oh well they were just doing it for attention and mm -hmm. and a, again that goes back to Sarah's call of you know let's stop the reduction of it I mean to to put someone's life on what is deemed to be such a an easy um, decoding of what was going mm -hmm. on. Um, you know, as someone that that struggled with substance abuse and, and with self injury and suicidal ideation, um, you know, if, if people are saying you're just doing it for attention, I'm like, well, if you see a solution, then give it to me. <laughs> like, then just, yeah, yeah, give me that yeah. conversation. If you think that conversation is going to fix everything, then then let me have it. And you know, I I think for for me, uh, and and y'all were talking a bit about the the self-imposed silence, the, I, I had that thought in my own mind um, that what's gonna happen when, when I share this, uh, maybe it's safer to, to not share it. And I was pushing people away without them even knowing I was you know, full arm, stiff arm, mm -hmm. you know, um, until I had a friend that I did try to straight up push away and with the mental um, perspective of, if they leave me alone, then I know I'm completely alone. Um, mm -hmm. expecting to be exiled at the end of this, my friend said, we are going to get through this together. It wasn't, I believe in you, you can do this. It was a, I'm not going to let you go through this alone. Mm -hmm. we can do this. So despite everything I built up to saying, I will be alone after this conversation, um, there were people that were loving me despite the reasons I was giving them not to. Yeah, and, 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 and real quick, and really quickly too, like, uh, and like just when you sharing your story, the the part of me is also like frustrated at the faculty for not seeing the thing and then addressing the thing immediately. And I think we tend to do that because I think we also project that, like, and that's a whole other conversation about strength and like black women's strength, right? Like, you can handle it, you can do it. And I think we do that for ourselves, we do that for other communities where it's like they got this. And like Chad, exactly to your point, like. You know, you're, you're gonna get through it. Like maybe I'm not, actually. Maybe I'm not in the right. space to get through it, and so I'm gonna need support. Um, but but I think part of that is, and Stevie, you spoke about it, and I think it's so important. And you look at a Kanye as an example, and again, for me, it always comes back to that empathy, where it's like, as opposed to maybe saying, "Oh, this person is seeking attention," or they're doing. I know they're clearly doing this because their album's about to drop. Like that's always the conversation. And I think for me, it's been healthier for me for me to go, okay, what is the other best case scenario in this situation? I'd rather someone disprove the 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 the, aff the affirmative um, opportunity as opposed to leaning into like the cynicism that would allow us to um, look at a situation as more of an opportunity as opposed to a, a serious call and cry for help, you know? Yeah. Yeah, man, just, uh, I guess I'll follow up with that, you know, um, just the solution to many problems we deal with in this world have to be rooted in empathy, you know, accountability, all that stuff. So like, instead of blaming or dismissing these issues or these situations, um, the importance is the understanding that these are core human issues that we deal with every day, you know? Well, Steve, I think you just uh, made a new t-shirt design, dude. Uh, okay. okay. The core, well, I the core of solutions will be rooted in empathy. Some of that effect. You said it better. No, no. Joel said he just said it. I just basically framed it in the way that no. I wanted to frame it, man. Just teamwork makes. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Love that. Um, well, we are rapidly approaching time, and uh, the last thing that any of us here want is that the conversation would end when we push in on this broadcast. So the hope is that something that you heard here today would be a source of encouragement to you, would be a source of information or inspiration to you. And we certainly want you to, to take what you uh, have, have absorbed here today and share it with your friends and family. Uh, share the campaign, share the Jed Foundation, share Mission 22. Um, I would love for uh, the panelists to go around and 
let us know where we can find you and, and your work uh, at the end of this broadcast. Uh, so let's start with, with Steve. Where, where can we find you on the World Wide Web? Uh, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, like all the platforms, uh, Steve Wynn, it's S-T-E-V-E-N-G-U-Y-E-N. -E -E um, well, first off, I just want to thank you all at Twilha for allowing me to be part of your collective voice. Um, you know, since joining forces with you guys, I've seen so much positivity, strength, uh, and bravery come from your following to me. And, you know, I hope my contributions to your movement have, you know, empowered others. And, you know, hopefully we can carry these messages of hope through whatever it is I write or illustrate or create for you guys. Jess, where can we learn more about the Jet Foundation? Um, as, as Steve said, thank you for having me here. I feel so privileged, I feel so honored to be here uh, with all of you. And um, you can find Jed at, in, on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, at Jed Foundation, um, literally at the Jed Foundation. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, for me, yeah, that's what I'm gonna say. Awesome. That's so awkward, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, same thing. It's been it's been great. Thank you for having us. Um, and same thing. We're on all social media, Mission Twenty Two, um, and Mission Twenty Two dot com. If anybody would like to apply for any of our treatment programs. Thanks, Sarah. And Joelle, Mr. Mag. <laughs> um, um, uh, echoing everyone, like this has been an absolute pleasure. I'm glad I was able to make time out to to, to sit with y'all. I think this has been so important, like healing. Um, at uh, J O E L A K A M A G Joel A K A Mag. Um, you'll find the affirmations. You'll find the poetry, the violin, the music, the art, and all that other stuff. Uh, but yeah, um, that's where to find me. Where I'm writing and doing story things. <laughs> and as always, you can find us at twloha.com. Uh, you can find out more about the campaign at Worth Living For. Dot com. Uh, again, this is one of three different roundtables that we're doing. Next week, we're going to have a brand new panel showing up, and we're going to be talking about barriers to help. Uh, so again, from the bottom of our hearts, all of our gratitude going to Steve, Jess, Joelle, and Sarah. Thank you for your time. Thank you all for tuning in, and we will see you on Tuesday with our next Instagram Live at 4 p.m. Eastern with our founder, Jamie Torkowski. You guys have an amazing weekend and we will see you next time. Hi everybody. Thank you.